बोलेगा सबको म्यूट पे डाल दो ना वी आर लाइव जेसी ओ लवली आई एम एडिटिंग ऑल अप Sukshma Singh, Mrs. Singh, how are you? Ah, <laughs> Suksham Ji. They <laughs> can allow them to mute, unmute. Actually, they are mute. They are mute. Oh, great. gentlemen boys and girls a warm welcome to papa jc talk show before we head straight to the topic there are a few things i would like to share about yesterday i received a few feedbacks i want to share just three feedbacks with you yesterday at the show i was requesting people to raise their hands to ask questions after the show i got a call from a school friend very innocently she said that she switched on her video and kept kept raising her hand behind the video and i did not see now friends raising hand is an option in zoom so please use that only if you want to ask a question it will be easy for me to see who wants to ask a question and we'll follow the queue so raising hand is not raising hand like this please okay then there was another question there's a feedback from a viewer that we are having back to back sessions of medical ailments now i'd like to uh, explain why we are doing this you will agree that we have made the opportunity of listening to best doctors in their respective fields in normal circumstances one has to wait for days to get their appointments today the situation is such that they are able to give time to us so let us all make the most of it and honor their presence right so that's why we are getting doctors here on board so that they can mera awaaz kahan chala gaya ravi Yes, sir. Okay, fine. Yeah. Get back. You can take back lots of things to learn from them because they are here to answer to most of your questions, and we can move on like this. Then I'm getting messages. The third one is I'm getting messages from people for attending the talk show. They are asking me how much they have to pay. Friends, there is absolutely no charge. our objective is to ensure that all of you take back something from every show that you watch so please keep coming back as we have many more topics to come and then also you can invite your friends we are trying to expand the skills so that more people can join in further please sms your feedbacks to me directly at 9830029224 my number is already flashed there may i now request kavita ji to introduce our guest of honor today absolutely so good afternoon everyone our eyes are a window to the outside world and they are probably the most important sensory organ so we have with us dr nandini ray who is a senior consultant of thermologist at fortis medical center she's completed her msc london in 1990 frc of thermology from london in 1991 in 1984 completed her mbbs from calcutta medical college went to uk in 1988 and trained there in various hospitals in the nhs in newcastle and london till 
She has been practicing at Fortis since 1996. She also has a personal chamber at Radiant Eye Foundation. She is a specialist in cataract surgery with premium advanced technology, IOLS. She's also done more than 18,000 surgeries till date. Also a specialist in bladeless robotic cataract surgery, which is known as FLAX, F-L-A-C-S. She's presented papers and many surgical videos at national conferences and in Europe at the ESRCS conference. There she is to take us through a great session on how to keep our eyesight healthy. Over to you, Papa JC. Thank you, Kavita. Uh, now I would request all of you to watch this video. <laughs> I'm so tired. <laughs> for having me here. Oh, yeah, it's uh, great to have you. It's an honor to have you, Dr. Sab. In fact, uh, you heard the objective that we have. Our intention is very clear, to reach out to more people with your answers. They have so many questions to ask. Likewise, oh. and they and you won't believe, uh, yesterday when I uh, announced in a special group, we have created a special WhatsApp group where we uh, have these people who are following this particular uh, platform. So I just mentioned that uh, Dr. Nandini Ray is joining. And uh, you won't believe we had a huge question. We had to request them to come on board, come at the forum and ask after that. We have, we have some 30, 35 questions lined up for you. Okay. Uh, would you like to start with some presentation or can we go for a straight Q&A session? You, you can just go straight for q and I'll, I'll leave it to you. I'm, I'm open to whatever. Okay, Anything Dr. that you would like to fire away. Thank you. Okay. Can we hear something from you about eyes? I mean, yes. there are different parts of eyes. Would you like to describe? How do you of course. Think? See, um, good morning, everybody. And thank you all for coming on to uh, the show. And thank you so much, Papa JC, for having me here. Um, I'd like to say uh, a few words about the eyeball. It's one of the most, it's the smallest, one of the smallest organs. And yet, it's a very complex organ. And it's a very important organ of the body because it is responsible for vision. I mean, where would we be without our eyesight? So very quickly, the eyeball from the, from, uh, from the front backwards starts with the eye, eyelids and the eyelashes. Then the round black part portion that you see is the fornea, which is crystal clear. The white portion is a sclera covered by the conjunctiva, which becomes red in a simple case of conjunctivitis. Then if you just take an anteroposterior view, Behind that is the anterior chamber, the black portion in my eye or the blue portion in a Westerner's eye is the iris, uh, which is also very important. We will come back to that. Behind the iris is the all important lens. We are born with a crystal clear crystalline lens, which later on forms a cataract after getting opacified uh, later on in life. Behind that we have the, um, on either side of the lens is a zonule because the lens is not just hanging there, it's being held in position with the zonular fibers. And on either side as a ring, there's a ciliary body which comes into play in glaucoma and uh, aqua secretion. Then behind the lens, we have a posterior chamber, which is full of the vitreous jelly, which is also very important. I'm quite sure certain questions will come up regarding the vitreous uh, jelly. Behind that, we have the retina, the all important nerve layer, which helps us to see behind the nerve, layer, we have the optic nerve because the eyeball is actually an extension of the brain, if you can say that. And the communication between the eyeball and the brain is actually that all important optic nerve. Over to you, Papa Jesse. Oh, lovely. Uh, although, uh, I will not remember any of these terms. 
Okay. Uh, now, uh, going back to this, uh, the questions we go on to. In between, I would like to share that we have a special WhatsApp group where we discuss the questions before we give it to our doctor here. So, if anybody wants to join, please send me a message at my number. I'll send you the link to join. Okay. The first question that we have is, we do periodic blood tests to find out about the functional status of almost all the organs, except for eyes. So, please suggest from birth of child till he grows old, when and what tests should we do to see if there is any hidden disease in the eye? Very quickly, uh, that's an excellent question. But uh, I think the most important thing before we actually send a child off for tests is as a parent or even as a school teacher, first as a parent and then as a school teacher, to be aware that eyesight problems can affect any age at any time. And give you some examples wherein, you know, parents have brought their children to me. They brought a newborn baby, maybe not a newborn baby, but a three month, four month, five month baby saying, I don't see that the child is smiling at me. There's no social smile. There's no smile of recognition. When I'm speaking to the child, the child is not focusing on my face and looking elsewhere if i'm uh, you know giving one of these things you know these um, uh, silver uh, things which make a noise these rattlers unless i make it rattle wherein the child is actually looking uh, uh, you know identifying it with the noise but it, even if it's a colorful rattle if you if i don't rattle it the child is not looking there or sometimes in a very perceptive parent they come up to me saying the child's eyes are moving, which is nystagmus, which is again a sign of neurological disorders, decreased vision. Or sometimes in a slightly older child, you know, uh, Doc, the child is squinting. One eye is looking at the television, the other eye is not. Or, you know, the child's eyes are going in. Often the parents often tell me either the child is not smiling or the child is not seeing or the child is not paying attention to rattlers or toys or colorful toys or if I don't squeak the toy in front of uh, him or her then the child doesn't actually look uh, at the uh, at the toy or the child's eyes are turning inward or outward and slowly at a later stage so this awareness is very important number two for a parent especially if a child if a, if a parent if a father or a mother has high power the mother might have had LASIK at the age of 21, 22, and might have forgotten that she had power. So you've got to remember that you may not be wearing glasses. You've had LASIK for a minus seven or a minus eight power. So your child may have the possibility of getting minus power. Your, your husband might be wearing power. You, 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 know, you, you might have got married to him when he was 28, but he might have been wearing glasses when he was four years old. So that history of parents, if not parents, then grandparents, that is also very important that I think my child needs an eye examination earlier than the others. If you see that the child is running towards the television, you're trying to drag him back. And after two minutes, again, he's running up to the television to see. That's one of the reasons that he may not be able to see. So be aware. I often tell a parent, if you have a four-year-old or a five-year-old sitting in the car, and if you suspect that he's got power, ask him to look at a billboard. Ask him to read a car number plate. See whether what you can see, whether your child can see the same. And now, as far as the teachers are concerned, often we get complaints of the teacher, the child is naughty, is not cupping properly, is not paying attention. But one, and another important thing, if the child is sitting at the back rows of the class, he always wants to come and sit in front, comes up to the blackboard to try and, you know, write down something from the blackboard. Now, those are the first indicators. The child may not be naughty or the child may not be sort of you know uh, uh, showing a lack of attention it might be that he's got a simple need to visit his ophthalmologist so tell the parents that you know i think your child needs an eye examination so as far as this is as far as children are concerned then obviously for teenagers anybody you know it's not that uh, my child has none of the above if you are going for an eye checkup just take your child for an eye checkup, if everything's all right, if your child is seeing, or if your young uh, sort of child in their preteens or teens, they're seeing well, they don't have any problems, 
just take them for an annual checkup. Or if there's a family history of myopia or high plus part, take them for a checkup earlier. Because if you nip it in the bud, if it is recognized early that a child has got power, then the possibility of lazy eye, which is undetected power, and wherein the child needed glasses, it was not detected, wherein the brain, in simple words, gets a bit lazy, doesn't want to use that eye, and it's even worse if one eye is normal and one eye has high power, so the brain is only going to be using the eye which is normal and is neglecting the eye which does have power which has not been detected and thereby not treated. So if amblyopia is detected very early, as in age four, five, six, Already it's late if it's after six, seven, because amblyopia or lazy eye can be detected and can be treated to a certain extent from till the age of eight to nine. So that degree of awareness that my child may have power, may have power, not just in both eyes, may have power in one eye, which is even more dangerous. If I don't detect it, if it is not treated, the child may have amblyopia. And after the age of 10, 11, you can't bring the child and say, the child has got plus four or, or minus five. Now, give him the glasses and make him see, doctor, what's going to happen to his future when you've, you've already missed the boat almost, so as to say. So that's very important. And uh, I think uh, uh, for a slightly more, more adult person, now if you forget the, ch the child and the teenagers, and in any case, the teenagers want to come because the young girls want contact lenses and after the age of 20, 21, we've already started talking to friends who are looking at the internet for LASIK and they want to get rid of their glasses or their contact lenses, so they become even more eager to visit their doctor. And obviously, they are more in the verbal stage. They are aware, and they can't see. They are taking exams. So that category of, 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 of children or young adults, they tend to present much more earlier. A child, one of the most important things is that a child does not present because in his own little mind, he thinks the world sees just the way that he is seeing. Yeah, right. That's very important. And uh, as far as uh, adults are concerned, I would say, be very, very careful. Even if you don't have diseases like diabetes, blood pressure, rheumatological problems, still pop in. You don't have to be 40. You don't have to have a, a need for reading glasses. You should go in because more and more, the world is uh, sort of becoming very gadget friendly, becoming very sort of used to you know, doing uh, sort of interviews like this on our laptop or your iPad, we're using more and more gadgets. So you do need an eye checkup because you're spending a lot of time in front of a laptop or an iPad at work. So there are things like computer vision syndrome. There are things like dry eye disease. You may be having a mild headache. You might be having a very slight power which you're not aware of. And you're straining your eyes while looking at a computer, while looking at a an iPad and you think, oh, well, it's just too much uh, uh, usage of the laptop, but you might just be having a 0 0.5 spherical power, a 0 0.75 cylindrical power, which you can overcome. So you have reasonably good vision, not great vision, but that little bit of power can give you headaches, can give you eye congestion, can give you eye strain. And above all, you're, you're probably working on a, a laptop for more, more than 10 hours a day. So you need advice about wearing glasses regularly, whether you have a refractive error or you have a little bit of power correction, whether how to use your gadgets, how many hours to use your gadgets, believe it or not, there are 10 commandments to prevent computer vision syndrome and to treat computer vision syndrome, what you have to do and why uh, you can get dry eyes with computer vision syndrome, what you do for dry eyes, what are the symptoms of dry eyes. So that is in the sort of young, sort of, I wouldn't call it middle age from the age of say, you know, 25 till the age of 50. Now, after the age of 50 in our sedentary lifestyles, you know, lack of exercise, you know, fast foods, et cetera, et cetera, tendency to get diabetes and all that is so much more, in spite of the fact that people are becoming more fitness, uh, you know, con conscious of fitness. But you have to be aware that after the age of 40, an eye checkup is mandatory. How much you see for long distance, for near, whether you know, you've got a family history of glaucoma, you've got to ask around your parents, your uncles. Number three, whether you've got a refractive error, a longstanding you know, problem with your uh, correction, which, which needs correction both for long distance and for near. Um, uh, you've got to find out whether you've got diabetes. You've got to be aware of how this sort of diabetes is going to affect you, your eyes. That is the most important thing. Many people have been diabetic for five, 10 years, 
And I'm quite sure that their family physician has told them to go in for an eye checkup and they haven't taken it seriously. So by the time the patient arrives with a 10, 15 year history of diabetes, he's already got diabetic changes in the retina. And that is the most important thing. Often, your ophthalmologist will be able to tell you, you know, whether your diabetes is under good control or whether you are a diabetic or not. And, you know, sometimes the patient says, oh, my diabetes has just been detected, you know, for one year and you're dilating the pupils and you're looking at the retina and I'm almost falling off my chair because there's so much diabetic retinopathy. And I, and I tell the patient that I'm quite sure it's been detected now because you've been to your family physician right now, but I'm quite sure you've had diabetes for some time. So often we are the ones, you know, who told the patient that, you know, you've got a diabetic retinopathy, immediately go back to your GP, we take photographs, we uh, tell the patient how important it is to keep your sugar, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, things like that under strict control. Go back to your family physician, your diabetologist regularly, get your blood pressure monitored because your blood pressure can cause hemorrhages in the retina. And along with all that, we will also do a screening for glaucoma which is, you know, checking the pressure, doing uh, analysis of your optic nerve, uh, doing a field of vision test, which is very important. You know, this is your field of vision. You're looking straight ahead at me, but your side vision is often affected in glaucoma. So those are the screening tests which need to be done. So your vision, unaided with glasses, if you need glasses, vision for reading, which is your, whether you've got presbyopia, which the Bengalis say, chulli shule chalshe, your intraocular pressure, assessment for dry eyes, a history as to how many hours of computer you are using. We do a little Shermer's test to find out whether you've got dry eyes, advice regarding dry eyes and use of gadgets and you know the, the uh, video display units. Um, a dilated fundoscopy is almost mandatory, whether you are having any problems or not. Assessment of the optic nerve. And then we, uh, at the first initial examination, we will do all that and then you know, give you a report as to whether you've got power, where, what you're, where you've got a cataract. Believe it or not, you may have a cataract even at the age of 40. Your intraocular pressure status, your glaucoma, whether you've got family history of glaucoma or not. And also, you will probably do a fundus photograph and a fields test. These are the various simple basic tests, wherein if you're absolutely 100 out of 100, I'll say, right, everything's absolutely fine come back in a year. Invariably, they come back in two years when they hear that everything is fine. But at least you've come back, you know, two years later. Okay. Very, very well explained, Dr. Sahib. In fact, you took us through the whole life now. Now, there are two sub-questions here. Normally, if I, as a patient, has to go as a, for the first time, is it okay to show to an optician's uh, uh, specialist because they have a machine where you sit and look through it? Is that enough or one should go for a proper thorough test at, at, for the child also? Well, um, if you if you have nowadays the optical stores have got good equipment and they've got good opticians, and they will do a fairly decent uh, thorough checkup, wherein at least your vision, your unaided long distance vision, your near vision, whether you've got a, a you know a spectacle a refractive error or not, that is the basic uh, information that you will get. They will probably give you a, a, a specs. And if you're not seeing well, then definitely, especially if your child is not seeing well, they will refer you to an ophthalmologist. And if you feel, oh my God, no, I'm, I'm, I'm 45, I've got a history of diabetes, I've got a history of high uncontrolled blood pressure. You know, I heard my aunt went blind from something. Uh, my father has an uh, uh, you know, early glaucoma. I hear her, uh, his doctor said early glaucoma. Oh, I'm wearing a minus 10. And I think my child squints a bit when, you know, looking at the long distance where he's rushing right up to the uh, television. Those are the simple things which I took in the first part of our uh, uh, question number one. Uh, if you have all that, I think just basically come directly to an ophthalmologist. Yes. Very good. In fact, a quick recap, doctor just explained for those who came in that we should have checkups done on a regular basis. As a child also, we should make sure that the child is able to see properly by trying to compare with what you can see. Like you're sitting in a car, you ask him what is the number of the car in front of you. If he can read it very well, as much as you can see, if he can see good enough. So we should do not, we should not ignore a child and let it go like that and the yes. power rises and then we can't Definitely. have anything. Fine. So let's go to the next question. The way we, we have to move because there are so many questions lined up. Okay. The next question is uh, in, in, in basic 
care, as in how to take regular care of our eyes. And does eye exercise actually help in correcting the sight of a person? Yes. The eyes are the most valuable organ. Uh, it is one of the most valuable organs in the, in the body. How to take care of the eye? Awareness of what could go wrong. Realization that you do need an eye checkup. Awareness and realization are part of eye care. And from day to day, number one, you've got to reduce the amount of television, iPad or mobile screen for a child and for an adult. If you have to use that much computer, you know, I will tell you about computer vision syndrome uh, in one of uh, the next few questions which come about. But also very important for a child to go in for regular eye checkups. Simple things like splashing your eyes out with water, clean water, may not always have to be drinking water, clean water. After a certain age, a little bit of warm compress of the eyelid margins at the end of the day to remove the day's sweat, dirt and grime and also to remove the early signs of blepharitis, which is very common. It may or may not be associated with dandruff, but about three out of 20 patients have got blepharitis. They've got scales along the eyelash margins and they've got itchy eyes and their eyelids are um, uh, you know, itching without you know, realization that they've got blepharitis. For young girls and for the ladies uh, who are watching in, removal of all traces of eye makeup is very important. Be very careful of any new eye makeup that you're using, simple things like that. And also uh, how to take care is that if you're a diabetic and a, a hypertensive patient or if there's a family history of blindness or glaucoma, definitely go in for a, uh, an eye checkup. If you're a contact lens wearer, there's a different topic altogether of care of contact lenses. It, do not ignore the fact that you know, you've got power. Power, spectacle power is not just meant for people who've, oh, he's got minus three, so he needs his power. I've got 1.5, so I don't really wear my glasses drop. But at the end of the day, they've got congestion of the eyes, they've got dryness of the eyes, they've got you know, difficulty in uh, you know, visualizing the world. You know? Because if you do have 1.5 power, you, know, you may need the glasses most of the time. So realization that you do need to wear your glasses all the time. These are the various ways. And after the age of 40, you must go in for a few medical tests, like a fields test, an eye pressure. Often I've got a 50 year old man or a woman sitting in front of me. And when I say, right, I'm going to check, my, uh, check your pressure. They bring out their arm and say, yes, yes, madam. So I said, no, not, not that pressure, your eye pressure. And they've fallen from the chair saying, oh, what do you mean? Pressure in the eye? Oh, the eye has a pressure, doc? So yes, the eye has a pressure. And the pressure does need to be checked. IOP, intraocular pressure, needs to be checked, preferably by an ophthalmologist in an ophthalmological clinic by something called a Goldman Applanation Tonometer. So this kind of realization is very important that yes, there is a pressure. Yes, certain you know, uh, clinical conditions like diabetes and blood pressure can affect my eye. I can be blind from those you know, various uh, 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 diseases. And uh, there is something called glaucoma. It's not just cataract. These are the various things that one has to be, uh, you know, very careful of. Okay, great. So uh, next question we have is, uh, just want to understand how can we remove the puffiness under the eyes and why does it occur normally? Is it related okay. to eyes or it's something else? Yes, puffiness uh, under the eyes or around the eyes can be related to a wide variety uh, of reasons. Simple reasons are, which are probably indirectly related, is overuse of eyes, 18 hours of Netflixing or 18 hours of computer, lack of sleep, okay? Apart from that puffiness of the eyes when a patient first comes to me, you'd have to start thinking about other things like thyroid disorders, fluid retention, you know, whether a person has high things like urea creatinine, whether you've got puffy feet as well and you haven't realized it whether you've got other uh, uh, disease processes, like, uh, you know, uh, there is something called, which is, uh, which is also related indirectly to the eyes is dermatochalasis, where you have, you know, drooping and puffiness of the upper eyelids, you know, and you've got puffiness around the eyes, which is uh, known as herniation of orbital fat. So your eye, eyeballs are all right, but with laxity of the, the skin and the muscles around the eye, the fat which surrounds the eyeball in a socket that tends to 
protrude out. So I actually tell the patient that these are puff puffy because you've got herniation of orbital fat. And that actually needs an oculoplastic surgeon. You might need a little tuck job. And if you're 75, you may not want it. If you're 40, and if you want those things to go, no amount of under eye cream can actually remove those herniated orbital fatty uh, outgrowths. But if all that has been ruled out by an ophthalmologist, then you've got to look at things like, you know, medical conditions. You've got to get your thyroid function test, urea, creatinine, blood pressure, assess whether your blood pressure medication is causing puffiness of the eyes and assess your regular lifestyle. You know how much tobacco you've got to get onto more green tea rather than colored fluids. <laughs> in, yes, sir, in fact, now uh, we have another question. The question is, why do we get a sty in the eye? Is it hereditary? Yes. Or what should one do to treat it? A sty is usually never hereditary. I mean, I, I, in my practice, I've never come across styes which are hereditary. Uh, a sty is a simple uh, word for a rather a complicated uh, topic because styes could be of two types. One is an external sty. If you look at your eyelid, there are eyelashes. An external sty, which is the so-called sty that we're called, you know, we commonly associate with, is painful, and if you look at it with a, on a slit lamp microscope, it's an inflammation of one of the eyelashes. So the base of the eyelash has a pustular inflammation. You remove the eyelash, the pus escapes, warm fermentation. That's much easier to treat in a way. There is something called an internal sty or a hordolium or a meibomian cyst or a calasian. Those are probably more common. And if you actually close your eyes and you feel the eyelid, you get a little lump somewhere, which is initially tender, and it's easier to treat at that stage. Often they say, look, there's a lump there. That's more an internal style of hordolium, because on each eyelid, upper and lower, we've got about 30, 35 oil producing glands called meibomian glands, which are very beneficial to the eye because it's that thin layer of oil on water which prevents the water of the eye from escaping, from evaporating. Too much or too little or inspissated secretions in those meibomian glands can cause blockage of the mouths of the meibomian glands along the lid margin. One of the glands swells up, there's a secondary bacterial infection, a granuloma forms, and then that lump forms, which if it is initially tender, a lot of warm fermentation, antibiotic drops, ointment and probably an oral course of antibiotics can help. This type of meibomian gland disease, which can cause calasia or meibomian uh, 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 cysts, so the internal styes, so as to say, may be associated with a condition, a skin condition called acne rosacea, where you see a ruddy skin where the nose is sometimes a little bit more uh, protuberant and you know it's full of acne. Now that kind of acne, facial acne, may be associated with an internal sty and the tendency to acne can be to a certain extent, to a certain extent familial. So that way, in a very tangential way, you can say it may be hereditary, but uh, I mean, there are so many other hereditary diseases to think about rather than thinking about styes as being hereditary. Well answered. I think she must, the person must have got the answer on this. Next is, this is a very common uh, problem that people face. The floaters. Are floaters indication of any harm to the eyes? I've been experiencing them in both my eyes since quite some time now. Do they, do they, do they lead to cataract or what do they indicate? Okay. Uh, That's a very interesting question. It's one of the most common problems. Having floaters is basically, if you look at the eyeball structure, the back of the eye, which is behind the lens, which later forms the cataract, between the lens and the retina is the posterior chamber. There's an anterior chamber in front of the lens and a posterior chamber behind the lens. The posterior chamber is full of a jelly-like substance called a vitreous jelly, which is almost 99% water and 1% protein fibers and you know various uh, elements and electrolytes, etc. Now, what happens in very simple words is that in youth, if I may call it that, the jelly is like a jelly. And what happens with age, there's degeneration, there's sequestration, there's degeneration and separation of the protein fibers from the rest of the water. And that protein meshwork 
forms floaters, which the patient complains of either as a spider's web, or it can happen as little musky volitantes, plenty of, uh, plenty of little black things floating around. Now, a normal person can have one or two floaters. If you look at a white wall, you'll see there may be one or two floaters, but an increase in the number of floaters, a difference, uh, uh, if there's a difference in the nature of the floaters, and especially if it is associated with flashing lights, you've got to present immediately. This is not a sign of a cataract. In fact, uh, to the contrary, if you have a dense cataract, you may be having floaters, but you may not actually see them because the cataract in the middle of the eye is preventing the rays of light from outside, passing through the jelly of the eye, which is the vitreous jelly, and casting a shadow. And that's how floaters happen. It's a slightly complicated phenomenon where those black things, when the rays of light enter through a clear or maybe a not so uh, uh, cataractous eye, a lens, when it passes through these little sequestered little uh, protein fibers in the jelly of the eye, that's casting a shadow on the retina. And what happens, it, it, it is common even after cataract surgery because suddenly the cataract, which is voluminous, is replaced by a thin foldable intraocular lens. So there's much more space for the jelly to separate from the retina. So the jelly, which is the vitreous jelly, undergoes a degeneration called a PVD, a posterior vitreous degeneration. And as it's separating from the retina, when you're looking here and there, it's hitting the retina. And the retina being a very electrical layer full of nerves, made of nerves, it responds by means of flashes. So if you have flashes and floaters, you do need an urgent ophthalmological checkup in simple words, because as the retina is crumpling and degenerating and separating from the retina, it can pull on the retina and you can get a retinal hole or tear. And this is more common in a post cataract state in a intraocular lens eye. And it is much more common in eyes which are myopic, which because they've got large eyeballs, their jelly is not a nice, tight, compact mass. It's a little bit lose because the axial length, that eyeball is so much bigger in somebody who has high minus power. So floaters are not normal. Floaters are not really the sign of cataract. If you have floaters, it means your pupil has to be dilated in an eye clinic. You cannot drive that day. You've got to bring some attendant who can take you back. And the detailed retinal examination needs to be done by a general ophthalmologist like me. And if I see something, which is in the periphery of the eye, like a retinal hole or tear, God forbid, you will be referred immediately to a retinal surgeon for a retinal cryo or a laser. So floaters is not good news. Again, half the world has floaters. If I look at a white wall, I'll have floaters. Those are musky volitantes, these tiny little floaters. But if there's a difference in the nature, in the number, especially associated with flashes, immediately go in for an eye checkup. Uh, we go to next. You want to take a have a glass of water or something? I'm fine. I'm fine. Thank you. Carry so on. Going on. Okay. The next is a very, uh, very important question because this is a very basic question. Rather, the question is how safe is it wearing lenses, especially for teenagers? Ideally, how many hours can one keep them on? Also, which is better for eyes? Or both are advisable? Or uh, you want to? I mean, should they switch over to the regular specs, or uh, they can continue wearing? This is how they are asking. I mean. Yes, Basically, yes, I them. understand. And it's a very common question. God did not mean for us to go around with an artificial contact lens on the eye. We do it mainly for vanity, also for convenience, and also we look better. The vision for very high powered people is better with a contact lens because that distance between the eyeball and the specs, that is, you know, neutralized. But yes, when to start contact lens is a very uh, uh, important question because in, for a general ophthalmologist, I mean, uh, I'm not dealing with pediatric cases where you can put in a contact lens even after cataract surgery at, uh, at the age of one month or two months sometimes, you know, or uh, when much younger. But in the vast majority, parents often come to see me that say, you know, my child is in class seven, my daughter's in class seven, she's very uh, self-conscious. I would say, hold on, hold on until... They're, they're in class nine, because let me tell you, young girls don't want to wear glasses, you know. Uh, and when they're going to a birthday party, they'll probably uh, go 
with the specs on. And when they enter the birthday party, they'll go around doing this. And I've got so many patients. So if the child is very keen to wear contact lenses, I say, all right, just get a pair of contact lenses. If they're responsible, you give them a pair of uh, contact lenses for a party, for a wedding, for a little uh, family bash, or probably just for a few hours of school, you know. And when you come back, simple rules and regulations of how to maintain hygiene for the contact lens is very important. Remove your contact lenses and be happy with a pair of specs at home when you're in front of a computer, when you're doing your homework, and then perhaps you wear your contact lenses for the daytime during school. Best time for contact lenses is after class 10. You know, you're 15, 16, so much more responsible. You know that, you know, uh, it, 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 simple things like that. You cannot go to sleep with your contact lenses. You could never put a contact lens onto a, red, uh, onto a red eye. You've always got to wash your hands, you know, uh, before you put your contact lenses in. You can't bung your contact lenses onto a dirty case. Those sort of uh, self-realization happens when you're slightly older. But if the child insists, all right, you can try them out, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, perfect. Okay, Nick, uh, we go to the next question. Now, this is a different topic altogether, which you mentioned a little while ago. That is computer vision syndrome. How to avoid it, how to take care of it, and for how long can we sit in front of the laptop while working? How much distance is good for this for watching? What are few exercises to prevent uh, yes. this to happen to us? Yes. You see, computer vision syndrome happens when you do a variety of wide reasons. Then we are looking at, you know, uh, multiple pixelated images on a computer. The eyes, the muscles, they tend to strain over a long period of time, especially if you've got dry eyes, especially if you have a spectacle power which you're not wearing, especially if it's very high contrast, if it's very bright, you know, simple things like that. So you've got to be aware that it exists, you know, You've got to realize that uh, there is an exercise for the rule of 20, 20, 20, 20 minutes of computer. Then you remove your eyes and look at something 20 feet away. Could be beautiful green trees outside a window. You look outside, blink 20 times. If not 20 times, blink as many times as you can over 20 seconds, probably after every, and then go back to the computer screen. So rule of 20, 20, 20. That relaxes the muscles which have gone into a spasm from looking at the computer for a very long time. Go, uh, get up, you know, walk around a bit, go for a little walk after every couple of hours, go for a you know, hot drink or, you know, go for, uh, just go to a neighbor's desk, come back. Because it, it, how many hours you can do computer is very subjective. There are bankers who are sitting in front of the computer the whole day. Now, what can you say? You, every, everything that they do is in front of a computer. So you've got to adapt to the fact that the world is actually going to be more or less paper free in another few years time and all work is actually going to be done on a computer. So rule of 20, 20, 20, another important thing is don't look up at the computer. Many people look, they keep their computer at a distance, you know, higher than the eye level. The computer should be a couple of inches lower than the eye level, you know, so that the palpebral aperture, which is this distance, is slightly low. If I'm looking up at a computer, it's like this. So my tear film is drying up much more. Okay. And blink frequently, blink frequently. Okay. And just use a lubricating drop from time to time, because you can get uh, things like dry eye disease, which is another very important, complicated uh, topic altogether. This Simply is fantastic. I think one of the best yeah. solutions that you've offered 20, 20, 20. I Yes. See, if people follow this 2020, I have learned it myself and I wrote it down. After 20 okay. minutes, 20 feet away for 20 seconds. Yes. That's the right thing, right? Absolutely. Excellent, excellent. I think we should all apply. And now yes, start sir. playing 2020 match. <laughs> okay. Next is uh, there is a question called pollen aller allergies. Yes. Eyes turning red. Anything you want to say on that? I mean, Very common problem. And uh, it can happen from childhood wherein there's a special name for it, vernal conjunctivitis or spring catar. And uh, if it happens in childhood, it's a little bit of a bugbear because it's going to stay till the age of 16, 17. And it, it, it can again present only in adults or those children can again present as adults. Some people, believe it or not, people especially who've got, you know, things like asthma or people who have like skin, allergic skin uh, reactions, 
there are some people who break into hives or uh, you know are more allergic than the other so people uh, who have fernal, children who have fernal conjunctivitis typically present you know to my chamber with about six seven prescriptions six seven doctors have diagnosed the condition correctly have given six drops with six different names or different versions of the same drop they've been all correct in their diagnosis but the the realization of the diagnosis has not hit the parent that my child has got allergic conjunctivitis he's going to have it the treatment of choice to prevent it is putting him inside a glass bubble and not allowing him out of that glass bubble which is obviously not going to be possible so there is vernal conjunctivitis or spring conjunctivitis there is a certain period of time during the year when it's worse spring time summer time where the amount of uh, you know flowering plants and things like that are more or early early uh, spring um so you've got to uh, tell the child be very careful when you come out you know come back from your playground splash your eyes with water wash your hands don't rub your hands don't rub your eyes with those dirty hands you can the child can also get allergic conjunctivitis with house dust so you know there are there are people who come and say we've tried everything as far as pollen are concerned you know what do we do we have flowers in the garden or the you know the child goes to a playground uh you've also got to realize that even house dust house might uh can cause uh, allergies so children who are very allergic i've often told um the, the parents to have a little hoover you know keep his room as dust free as possible keep the environment as dust free as possible and there are many anti allergic drops which are available uh, uh especially olopatadine bupropion which are coming into the market you can use one drop twice a day uh for two or three uh, weeks and see but things like cold compress clean, keeping the eyes clean keeping the eyebrows and the eyelash margins clean telling the child not to rub the eyes as a rub itch itch rub rub itch itch rub the more you rub the more it itches the more it itches the more you rub so prevent the child from rubbing take a little ice cube and a hanky and do dry sort of moist cold compress uh, that often helps and uh, just like if we have something bitter we quickly have water to wash the uh, mouth simple water in a refresh tears or something like a lubricant eye drop to wash away the allergy that often helps as well before you actually go into a chemical control so is the same solution for the itchy eyes as well yes so that's itchy right. eyes yes if you have itchy eyes you've got to uh, first follow the advice read up a little bit about itchy eyes realize that it's a part of your lifestyle especially for a child is going to remain till late teens it may come back and you've got to realize that uh, follow the various things about anti dust washing your hands splashing the eyes out with cold water keeping the skin around the eyes scrupulously clean and using an anti allergic drop so this covers both the topics now next we are going into another topic the most important topic rather the most frequently asked question is dry eyes now yes. the question that i'm just reading out the question the answer will be covering most of these questions why does it happen what is the treatment why do we feel irritation in summers is the symptom of dry eyes are gadgets actually harmful especially for kids i know of a family where there are two kids one is playing using gadgets the other one hardly uses on a routine eye checkup the one hardly using gadgets has power while the other one does not the dry eyes comes weak as per doctor now all these are related to dry eyes now would you like to elaborate on this yes um you see the tear film when uh if if i'm looking sideways and you're taking a cross section of the tear film there's a layer of fluid which is covering the eyes you see the eyeball is not dry it's a moist layer there are three layers in the tear film on a microscope the outermost layer is the lipid layer which is the oil layer this oil is secreted by the meibomian oils of the lid margin the meibomian glands each eyelid has about 30 35 meibomian glands which secrete a protective clear oil which covers the middle layer which is the aqueous layer which is the watery layer of the tear film the aqueous layer is secreted by the lacrimal gland by the accessory lacrimal glands in the conjunctiva and then we have the innermost mucin layer the innermost layer which is the closest to the eyeball so the tear film which is that very thin watery layer 
on the eyeball has got three layers, the oily layer, which prevents the evaporation of the middle layer, which is the aqueous layer, and then the mucus layer, which holds on to the watery layer. And dry eyes could be like an evaporative dry eye, which is due to, you know, the oily secretions either being uh, not uh, quite clean or not good enough, or, you know, the secretion of the oily glands or the meibomian glands is either too much or too little or of a different chemical composition wherein it's not, it does not serve its purpose. So that is an evaporative layer. And then you have basically an aqueous deficiency, an aqueous deficiency wherein the oils are all right, but the, there's a deficiency of aqueous. And then you have the mucus layer, which uh, there is a deficiency of the mucin layer or basically exposure of the mucin layer because the oils and the water have evaporated, leaving the mucus layer, which is exposed. So it's a very complicated three layers preventing exposure of the eyeball. And in simple words, like if you have problems with the oily layer, you've got to address the meibomian glands. The meibomian glands of the eyelid margins, you've got to address a condition called blepharitis. And nowadays, you know, there's a tear film science laboratories, laboratories which deal with mybography. You know, uh, you are actually, there are two or three such laboratories all over the country, where in really resistant cases of um, uh, mybomian gland disease are being referred over there, where you have studies which actually go to show that your mybomian glands are defective. Mybomian glands have to be rewired and treated so that they secrete correctly. And there is something called lippy flow. There's actually a lid spa wherein you do warm compress, which is not working. So you actually get admitted to these tear film uh, labs wherein you get a lid spa sort of done where you study the flow of the mybomian glands, the number and structure of the mybomian glands, and you explain to the patient that this is where the problem lies. And um, they go through this uh, mybography or uh, uh, tear film science uh, laboratory tests wherein uh, the examination of the mybomian glands is a must and it actually goes to show that where your problem lies. But simple things like warm compress, cleaning of the laid margins thoroughly, prevention of blepharitis or treatment of blepharitis with an antibiotic ointment at the end of the day. That is also very important. Prevention of dandruff and treating of dandruff is very important. So uh, that's the scientific side and the practical side is, uh, you know, treatment of, the, of what you can see, which is the blepharitis. Then for aqueous secretion problems for dry eyes, you can use simple things like uh, tear film substitutes. Anybody with a dry eye problem needs a rheumatological examination. There is a large belly of a large number of patients who have rheumatological problems like arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome, you know, which can cause things like keratoconjunctivitis sicca. These are big names for big problems and you do need a rheumatological problem. You might just be having little aches and pains in the small joints of your hands in the morning without realizing you've got arthritis and arthritis can attack your uh, lacrimal glands, the accessory lacrimal glands, wherein your, you can have things like dry eyes and dry mouth. And that's a much more sort of complicated subject altogether, but you've got to realize that there are certain medications that you take like antihypertensives, chronic uh, anti-allergics, antidepressants. They can all affect your aqueous layer, the secretion of the water in the eye wherein you can get dry eyes. You can also get dry eyes from excessive use of computer. As we said, the various, uh, uh, the, the 10 commandments to treat and prevent computer vision syndrome. One of them is frequent blinking. Blinking because when you're looking at a computer, when you're reading something on a computer, when there's a project you've got to complete, you forget how to blink. We normally would blink, you know, a certain number of times, which becomes about eight times a minute only, eight or nine times a minute. So there's, what happens is that the entire tear film, there are little dry spots, which happen and you don't realize. And then you blink when it's too late. And then at the end of the day, your eyes are dry, the eyes are red, the eyes are aching. 
but frequent blinking and looking away and then again coming back. That makes sure that your tear film is smooth and there are, there's no such thing as an increased TBUT, tear film breakup time, which is always tested for. That's also very important. So um, a simple thing like, you know, when you go, if you are having problems, if you are on the computer a long time, you need an eye checkup. You need to go on and find out what is CVS or computer vision syndrome and why we are telling you uh, to blink, why we are telling you to do a little bit of warm compression, cleaning your lip margins at the end of the day, why the rule of 2020 is important. Help in the prevention of dry eyes. And obviously, what is very important is uh, lubricating drops. Okay. So, and, uh, uh, we'll take a quick recap into what you said. So those who join late, uh, what she's talking about, what doctor is talking about is 20, 20, 20. This is a very good learning we've had today, which means after every 20 minutes, look 20 feet away for and blink for 20 seconds. That is the best way you can save your eyes from going into dry eyes and all. Okay. Uh, uh, Kavita ji, can we go up, open the questions? Can we ask? Uh, can, can, you must have received a lot of questions on the chat box. Yes, there are a lot of questions. Can you please ask them? Yes. So the first question goes, I have bifocal par. Can I get options for similar par in lens? Do you recommend laser treatment for bifocal par? Right. You definitely can get bifocal uh, contact lenses, which are the multifocal contact lenses, which treat both the press biopia, which is your reading vision, and your, uh, uh, if, you can, if you have astigmatism for long distance, you have toric uh, contact lenses as well. So that option is there for better long distance and near vision. Now, LASIK for near vision correction is a complicated subject. It can be done. There are many procedures available. I'm not a LASIK surgeon. But yes, if you are very keen that you are not going to wear glasses for reading, if you're not going to wear glasses for, uh, if you're not going to wear bifocal uh, glasses, then you can consult uh, uh, one of the topmost LASIK surgeons in, in Calcutta or um, anywhere in India. There are certain centers which are, where they are doing press biopia corrections. A complicated subject. I wouldn't do it for myself. No way. Uh, I would perhaps... Uh, uh, wear contact lenses uh, if I had to go in for press biopic uh, correction. Sometimes. Next question, Kavita ji. Yes, can migraine affect vision? Yes, migraine often presents with problems in vision called aura, where the patient suddenly sees, you know, stars and flashes and star spangled parts of uh, the visual field missing, you know. And uh, you can get things like acathalgic migraine, where you basically don't have pain. You can get a migraine where you can present with visual field defects, which uh, again become normal. So yes, uh, and also uh, it can affect your vision because sometimes you, know, you just get severe eye aches and watering of the eyes and things like that, which can affect your vision as well. Next okay. question. Next question. What is cylindrical power? Is it curable or does it increase the... Vitamin increase with age. Uh, cylindrical power is also known as astigmatism. Like if you look at your prescription, the first power is your spherical power, which is DS. The next power is your cylindrical power, which has a certain axis or a degree. So in very simple words, cylindrical power is when your eyeball is not like a football. A football is the same power in every axis. If your eyeball is like that, oval, there's a certain power in one axis and a greater degree of power, a different power in that axis. So that is cylindrical power. It can be treated because everybody's spectacle correction has the base power, which is the spherical power, and superimposed on that is your cylindrical power, which is your astigmatism power. It can be corrected by specs. It can be corrected by contact lenses. It can also be corrected by means of LASIK. So consult the best LASIK surgeon if you don't want contact lenses. And what is very important is that if you have an increasing astigmatism or an increasing cylindrical power, that is not good news at all because it could be possible that you may be having a condition called keratoconus, which is an early warpage or a change of the corneal curvature. 
which is also associated one, with one of the previous questions of itchy eyes. Children who rub their eyes or adults who rub their eyes constantly at the end of the day, you're actually promoting this warpage and change of corneal uh, keratometry or corneal curvatures. So if your astigmatism is increasing every year, if the axis is changing, get in touch with a cornea surgeon, get in touch with your general ophthalmologist and say, my astigmatism was quite stable, but it's changing. And yes, I do rub my eyes. So they'll go in for corneal topography and tomography to find out whether you've got is uh, keratoconus or not. Okay, before you go to the next question, uh, doc doctor, there are uh, requests asking for your number to be flashed, some, some secretary's number if you want to share. Please. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, you see, right now we're in a bit of a lockdown phase, but my uh, secretary uh, counselor's number is 900703661. 900703661. There's a Fortis helpline, which should be opening up uh, shortly, which is 6620-2000. 6620-2000, which is Fortis, extension 315. I'm sure things should open up by 21st, hopefully. And uh, my own personal chamber is 2454 4974 or 73. 2454 4974 or 73. Councillor 90070 36611. Available on WhatsApp. Okay, good. So uh, people have noted this. Now, uh, Kavita ji, next question, please. Yes. How can I bring down the eye pressure in glaucoma patients? Yes. You have to first find out whether you have glaucoma because high pressure does not always mean glaucoma. Glaucoma is when you actually have uh, an, an organic damage. You might just have a slightly high pressure with nothing else which is wrong, which is then going to be labeled as a glaucoma suspect or an ocular hypertension, and you need to be followed up regularly with field tests and OCT and HRT, those tests which will show whether you've got glaucoma or whether you've got a tendency to develop glaucoma. Once your pressure is high enough or once your pressure is just slightly high, or sometimes even if the pressure is not that high, you can have glaucoma. Previously, we used to say pressure more than 21 is glaucoma, pressure less than 21 is not glaucoma. Nowadays, pressure 15 can be glaucoma because the way we are defining glaucoma, the way glaucoma is presenting is very different nowadays. And uh, so that's a very broad uh, subject. How to get your pressure down is through medication. There are various medicines which are available, drops which are available to get your pressure down. Sometimes you might need one, sometimes you may need two. And perhaps sometimes if two drops are not working, uh, very rarely with your, with your glaucoma specialist contemplate putting in a third drop or sometimes there's a combination of two drops in one drop and sometimes they may if with progression of your visual field coming down or other uh, factors like a family history of glaucoma family history of somebody going blind uh, with a glaucoma glaucoma surgery etc etc we might advocate uh, an earlier glaucoma um, surgery or if you have a cataract to get the glaucoma treated side by side along with the cataract Okay, great. Uh, Kavita ji, just a minute. Uh, let's, uh, yeah. before we go into the another very interesting subject, which is called cataract, let's have a few question and answers from the audience, from people who are watching. We have one okay. hand raised by uh, Vani, Vanita Bajodia ji. Vanita Bajodia ji, would you like to ask, please? Vanita Bajodia ji, if you could ask. Okay, next uh, hand raised is Sangeeta Mehra ji. Would you like to ask? Ravi, uh, uh, are we allowed to unmute? Ravi? Okay, Sangeeta Mehraji, you are unmuted. You can ask. Yes, doctor. I just wanted to know that my granddaughter, she's seven years old and she has squint in the right eye. It is convergent squint. So what is the line of treatment for squint and does it really go away? Okay. Uh, been, excuse me. She has been put on glasses. Mm -hmm. She's been put on glasses. And doctor has said that initially the power will increase and then gradually it will decrease. So okay. what, what do you suggest? 
uh, I haven't seen your uh, daughter. One of the questions that I'd like to ask is, um, uh, when did she develop the squint? She is seven years old. She's my granddaughter. And I know, but when was it diagnosed? The we, we, we just realized when she was six months old and then we showed her to the doctor. And say about two, three years back, they have started the treatment. Okay, if uh, the hyper, if the conversion squint was present at the age when she was six months old, it could very well be an infantile esotropia, which basically means, yes, she will need glasses. I'm sure she's been probably put on exercises. She needs regular follow-up. The choice of doing surgery, if it's required, will depend on whom you're seeing. Um, you, it, it really uh, needs to be evaluated at regular intervals. Um, mm -hmm whether or not surgery is required, only your doctor will be able to tell you or not, depending on the angle of the squint and how she's responding uh, to the spectacles, whether she's got amblyopia or not, which I said, you know, the lazy eye factor or not. Um, if there's a large hypermetropic squint, if there's a large squint, in my very limited experience, I used to do a lot of squint at one point of time. I call myself a cataract surgeon now. I don't think it's going to go away uh, by itself. So probably so surgery is required according to Yes, you. maybe, maybe very well be. I don't know. Yes. Thank you, doctor. Okay, next question we have is uh, from Harish. Harish, just a minute, I'll unmute you. Okay. Yeah. You're on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Uh, there is a, uh, I want to know about the temporary blurred vision problem which occurs for half an hour, one hour and goes again. It is regularly, if it is coming uh, once in a month or week, what is this and how to treat this? Uh, can I ask you a question? The temporary blurred vision that you're having once in a month, does it happen in both eyes simultaneously? Does it happen in only the one eye? Is it blurring of vision or is it loss of vision? Is it like a dark curtain yes. which comes and goes away? Or is it like a vague, a uh, thora thora, kabi kabi dhundla pan red? Thora sa dhundla type, thora sa ah. dhundla pan. That but thora not sa. Clear ah. yeah. Everything I can see, but it is a little bit. Uh, I can say it is not prominent as required in the eyes. Is it in happening in both eyes together? Yes. Okay. Together. And it's happening once in a month. It may be once in a month or four or five months, two, three months. It is. It right. happens only two or three times till now. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, blurring of vision temporarily can be a wide variety of reasons. Number one, it could be computer vision syndrome. Number two, it could be dry eyes. Number three, it could be uncontrolled blood pressure. It could be uncontrolled diabetes. And worse comes to worse. It could be something called amaurosis fugax or TIA, transient ischemic attack, wherein you may or may not get a blurring, but you may sometimes even get a loss of vision. So the history is not completely uh, pointing in any one direction. You've got to check your blood pressure, your diabetes, your cholesterol. Uh, you've got to find out whether you've got a bit of computer vision syndrome, overuse of, uh, uh, of uh, your eyes, and most important thing is that you've got to remember that is it amaurosis fugax, which is the worst case scenario where you don't think it could be a transient ischemic attack, wherein the blood flow through the, the neck to the brain is affected. So you've got to actually rule out as many problems and then present yourself to your family physician and your GP for things like echocardiogram, ECG, fasting lipids, carotid Doppler, and beyond as to whether <laughs> circulation to the brain is all right or not. Okay. Uh, can we have a question from Sujata Ram Buryaji? Good afternoon, doctor. Uh, my uh, problem is similar to the last question which you answered. Uh, once in a year, from the right eye, my vision becomes blur. I had seen a doctor two years back and he said it was arthritis of the eye. And he gave me steroids and he said it will keep happening and suddenly it will go away. Consecutively, last three years it has happened. I have to take steroid drops. And this year it still not happened. I mean, it happens around the month of August, September. So why does this happen? I don't have diabetes. I don't have blood pressure. I have thyroid and I'm overweight. If you are being told that uh, uh, you've got arthritis in the eye 
And if you are being given steroid drops, almost certainly uh, you have something called iritis, which is inflammation of the eye, in which case, number one, you will get redness and congestion and pain and light sensitivity. And number five, you will get blurring. You don't get blurring of vision without any of the others. You will get thoda thoda dar, thoda thoda redness, thoda thoda uh, uh, pain, and you will get blurring of vision. And that can be concluded as arthritis in the eye for which you would have been given steroid drops. So just find out, you need a slit lamp examination. Very important. You need, uh, definitely you are being seen by your rheumatologist or your family physician for your other blood disorders. But if it's happening for a certain period of time in the year, once in a year, and you are being given steroid drops, which works, almost certainly you've got an inside inflammation of the eye, which people like us, we've got to look at you on a slit lamp, check whether you've got old signs of inflammation in the eye. Because I can sometimes look at an eye and I tell the patient, I think you've had something called iritis in the past. And the doctor and the patient says, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I used to get iritis. That's right, you're right. Oh, did you see that in the eye, doctor? And the answer is yes, you are left with remnant signs of old iritis, which needs to be checked out. But I've never had the four symptoms of redness or pain. And suddenly when I'm, I, I drive a lot, okay? Yes. And uh, suddenly I feel that my right eye is blurred. I have never had these four symptoms. Suddenly I start seeing blood. Well, that is not matching. That is perhaps not matching with um, iritis you should rule out, you, you need a full uh, examination with your vision, okay. your color vision, your visual field, your optic nerve analysis. A lo lot of things, I, uh, you know, can, can be, you know, missed perhaps. You know. Okay, great. Thank you so can much. We, can we move to the next question by Simi Gupta ji? Simi Gupta ji, are you there? I'll unmute you. Okay, fine, you're there. Sivi Gupta ji, are you there? We move to the next question. Anupam ji, are you there? Good afternoon. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Good afternoon, doctor. Good afternoon. Take care, take care. Sivi Gupta ji, you safer. Sivi Gupta ji, Anupam ji, are you Yeah. Yes. Uh, doctor, I have a, a question for you. Yes. Uh, I am 50 years old now. Yes. In 10 years, I have been told I was a glaucoma suspect. So when I got my test done, uh, certain doctors in Calcutta said I was glaucoma suspect. Outside Calcutta, they told me I didn't even have a trace of glaucoma. I'm having this problem from 10 years with, between doctors varying opinions. Currently, my problem is that uh, I have a power, difference of powers, great difference of powers in both eyes. Okay. And... I now hearing you out, I realize, yes, I am getting a little onset of early arthritis. The question here is that the last doctor has asked me to get a VFA 32, both eyes. Do you think this will solve my problem that if I have glaucoma, am I a glaucoma suspect? Uh, I think uh, Humphrey's visual field analyzer is probably what they've asked you to do, 30-2. Uh, that is a basic test. Nowadays, that you had, yes, you had a 30 2. That is, more, it, but... yeah, you should go in for things like OCT of the uh, uh, RNFL uh, and macula. Uh, look at okay. look for early loss of uh, thickness of the ganglion cell layer in, in the macula, macula, uh, the nerve layers in the macula, which an OCT will reveal in early cases of glaucoma. Serial OCT, serial visual field, not just once in a year. If, if, in, a, in a place like America, they'll probably do it every you know, four to five months kind of thing. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, it is always better to be safe than to be sorry because glaucoma is a silent killer. You know, yeah. I would always like to be, if there's an, even an iota of doubt, I mm -hmm. would like someone to say, you know, Dr. Ray, I think Perhaps you've got a little suspicion of, of glaucoma. Why don't you just come back every year to me, you know, uh, rather than somebody saying goodbye, you're absolutely wonderful. If you've been seen by many doctors in Calcutta, I'm quite sure there must have been something which, uh, you know, they must have seen or they must have suspected. Because in the worst case scenario, I have patients where 
you've told them that please come back in a year and they, they've come back to you five years later. And in those five years, a lot of that optic nerve has been damaged. Where, wherein if they had had that little fear that, you know, uh, that doctor had a suspicion in their minds. Okay, so let me just go back every year and get it checked. It doesn't mind if you can delay a cataract by six months to a year, but if in glaucoma, you, you really feel uh, terrible if the patient is just been lost to follow up because they've been so blasé. So I think it's very important not just to have a 30-2, but to have an OCT uh, okay. regularly of the macula and the RNFL, to have disc photography, comparison of disc photography, to have something called a gonioscopy, an intraocular pressure check, an intraocular pressure check at about four or five different times of the day. You might have a normal pressure in the morning and a different pressure in the evening. So often we've told the patients, come back every three hours. You know, sometimes I finish my chamber at six. I've got a colleague who works till eight. I said, you go and see my colleague with my letter saying, just let him check that pressure at eight o'clock. And I might have a colleague who's sitting uh, at eight o'clock in the morning and I might start after OT at 10.30. So I've asked another colleague, get that early morning pressure. There's a huge variety. So find out whether you've had something called a diurnal checkup of intraocular pressure. There are many aspects to glaucoma which, which are not known. Right. So uh, if somebody has suspected, give that doctor the benefit of doubt, I feel. Thank you. Uh, speak of the Thank you. Uh, doctor, are you comfortable? Yes, I'm perfectly comfortable. Let me I, share I see, some uh, statistics with you. I see patients from nine to six without taking a break. So <laughs> carry on. Let me just share a statistics with you. We had shared a polling. We did a polling right now about the yes. performance so far. 97% people have said it's excellent. Thank you. And what the about 3% who did not think? No, the, the rest said good. Okay. We had four options there. The only, we got only two responses, excellent and good. So I believe... Very, very polite, Papa JC. No, I can share the I can share the entire thing with you. It's going very fine. So let's go to the next question. We yes. have uh, Anupamji waiting here. Are you there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon, doctor. Good afternoon. Uh, Ma'am, I have a question. My yes. son... 21 years of age yes. and uh, he's having minus power in both his eyes. Uh, in, it was uh, uh, it initially detected uh, sometime when he was around uh, 8 years of age. Uh, at present, the uh, power is around uh, minus 11 in both the eyes. Okay. And, and uh, I was wondering your advice whether we should go for a LASIK or a femto LASIK or an ICL or any other advice which you, you, you may want to give us. Okay. Minus 11, you said? Yes, ma'am. Minus 11, it's highly unlikely that he'll be suitable for LASIK. Or right, ma'am. Femtolasic. Unlikely, uh, very unlikely, because uh, you see, in LASIK, you're removing part of the tissue in femtolasic right. as well. And minus 11 you, means you have to have a very thick cornea for there to be enough residual bed. Now, I don't do LASIK. I've got uh, two or three uh, people that I refer to. Uh, and, you know, if you consult me, I will always take uh, their opinion. The most important thing is that at least two to three years power has to remain stable. Somebody who has a minus 11 at the age of 21, I would wait for another one or two years. There's absolutely no hurry. Number two is that with a minus 11, uh, there are procedures called SMILE. But again, it depends on whether your cornea is thick enough for you to let the cornea have enough of the residual bed. Otherwise, it'll become ectatic. You might get a keratoconus. You might have other problems. The cornea is a very valuable part of your uh, eyeball. An ICL can always be done in the best of hands, but then that is a procedure. That is an intraocular uh, sort of very thin uh, a, a type of contact lens, uh, which is going in, a type of uh, lens which is going in, which rests on a normal lens, that less than 1% chance the normal lens is touched, that can form a cataract. Now, again, that needs to be, you have to consult the best ICL surgeons. So first and foremost, you've got to find out whether your power is stable. Number two, you've got to find out whether your cornea has any ectasia. You've got to do detailed topography, tomographic studies to find out whether you've got an early keratoconus, very important. You know, and number three, whether you're suitable for LASIK, femtolasic, or SMILE, 
And if you're not suitable for any, suppose you have a very thin cornea, less than 500, I'm sure you're not suitable for any perhaps, in which case you're going for ICM. And then the million dollar question is, do I need or will I go in for an ICM? Now, doc, tell me what are the complications of the procedure? Then you're a well-informed patient. The choice is yours. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks. We need, to, we need to go to our major topic, which is cataract, which is again a uh, broad-based topic. We'll hold on to these questions for a little while. Uh, doctor, we'd like to hear from you, uh, your uh, field of expertise. Having done over 18,000 operations, cataract happens to be the, one of the most uh, important part of eyes uh, subject because it happens to everybody. Almost everybody has to go through it. And now the, uh, the most important thing is that is cataract only age-related, or as in somebody who's crossing a particular age, you get it, or it can start early? Why does it happen, and how, and what is the best procedure possible, and how should we take care post-cataract operation? What are the risks uh, involved in that, and what are the best kinds of lenses to be used? So we'd like to hear a lot about cataract, because cataract is, again, a very, very interesting topic for everybody. See, the, the vast majority of cataracts that I see in my practice are age-related. The vast majority are patients of a certain age coming to me for cataract surgery. Now, again, cataracts are not always just age-related. Even a newborn baby can have cataract due to various uh, internal congenital problems, congenital cataracts due to various hormonal endocrine problems, both in the mother and in the child. It could be related to trauma. You've been hit by a tennis ball at the age of eight and you present with a cataract at the age of 16. You know, it could be blunt trauma. It could be penetrating injury as well. You know, poked in the eye with a, uh, a pencil and the patient presents one year later with a cataract. So a penetrating injury will present much earlier with a cataract than a blunt injury, which can present, say, a 40-year-old man, if he comes to me and he's got a unilateral cataract, I often say, were you ever hit with, oh, with, with something? I said, oh, yes, that, now that you mention it, I was uh, in a badminton match and the shuttlecock hit me, whoa, I still remember that injury. But are you trying to say that that injury has caused the cataract? And the answer is yes, because there are other signs in the eye on a stiff knife examination, which is pointing to the fact that it's probably going to be a traumatic cataract. It could also be related to problems like diabetes. Uncontrolled diabetes can cause an early cataract. Radiation, if you've been exposed to radiation, that can cause an early cataract. So there are a wide variety of reasons. Family history or steroid use. You've been put on steroids due to certain you know, uh, uh, medical conditions. Steroids can cause cataracts. Family history, if a 48-year-old person comes to me, I say, you're quite young to have a cataract. Uh, what about your parents? Did they have an early cataract? Oh, uh, no, uh, my mother was about 54. Now, in your mother's generation, for a 54-year-old person to have had cataract surgery is early because 30 years ago, the awareness and the diagnostics and the general need for brilliant vision was not that much there. People are complaining much more right now. They want it and they want it all. They will not tolerate any imperfections of vision. They will not tolerate even a 5% drop in vision. So right now, patients are coming to me at the age of 45 saying, my vision is blurred. I can't see my golf ball. The numbers on my computer screen are very slightly hazy. I'm having a very slight glare while driving at night. Whereas 30, 40 years ago, patients would be presenting much later with the same degree of cataract. That's what I'm trying to say. So the vast majority of cataracts, yes, are age-related. There are various types of cataract. And nowadays, there's been a vast change in the type of cataract surgery that was done. 30, 35 years ago, when I started cataract surgery, I was making an incision about 10 millimeters, removing the cataract as a whole, putting in a hard, rigid intraocular lens in, and then putting in five stitches with nylon. Then that went on to small incision cataract surgery where the incisions got a little bit smaller, but the lenses were still a bit rigid. And then that went on to phaco emulsification, which was ultrasonic drill kind of thing, removing the cataract through a small incision. So more and more emphasis was placed in to sort of, you know, reducing the size of the incision 
because the patient wanted to go back early to work, the patient wanted to have a bath early, the patient wanted visual rehabilitation early. So with the advent of small incision cataract or with the advent of FACO, the intraocular lenses, which were hard and rigid and six millimeter optic size, that became much smaller. The incisions that I'm using is two to 2.2 uh, millimeter incisions, tiny. And through that, now the latest intraocular le lenses, their materials have changed, their sizes and shapes have changed, wherein you are now folding a lens to go in through that 2.2 millimeter incision and they are unfolding inside that capsular bag, which is uh, retained in the eye, and it's finding its own place. And the type of intraocular lenses that we are using are, are the best in the world. The best intraocular lenses are now available, which can correct your long distance vision. It can correct your near vision. It can correct your astigmatism power. It can correct both your near vision and your astigmatism power. And although there's a huge armamentarium of investigations which are necessary, we have the best FACO and not just FACO, the technique of FACO has changed, wherein the gadgets, the machinery which are being made to do the FACO emulsification, that has the latest technology, which is invaluable to the structure of the eye. We don't want any huge changes in the intraocular pressure. We don't want the eyeball to go out of its way, even by a micromillimeter, so as to say. When that cataract surgery is being done, so that it's, it's absolutely delicate, as delicate as it can be for the various structures of the eye, the retina is not damaged, the optic nerve, perhaps compromised with glaucoma is not damaged. And once the cataract is removed with active fluidics technology, which is one of the latest FACO technologies available, um, a removal of cataract surgery available, we can put in the best quality lenses, the aspheric lenses, aspheric optic lenses with square edge design, foldable lenses, which are made with the best quality, uh, you know, ac acrylic materials. And they can correct your astigmatism, which is a toric lens. They can correct your press biopia or reading vision, which are the trifocal lenses. They will give you vision both for reading, for long distance, and for doing a Zoom meeting with Papa JC. So you, know, uh, uh, you, you, you can have it all right now, provided there are no contraindications. And now Calcutta has FLAX, which is the femto laser assisted cataract surgery, which I've specialized in. Um, and this is basically, you're not talking millimeter, you're talking micromillimeter. All the steps which were manually done in FACO are being done with a high-tech femto gadget, uh, femto equipment, which is a very expensive piece of equipment, which, are, which is present in at least three centers in Calcutta. And uh, femto surgery is now available it is costly, but it is state of the art, wherein uh, all the steps of FACO, which is initially done, are done like robotic. It's bladeless surgery. So you can imagine what I'm doing with a blade for FACO is bladeless with FEMTO. So that is the latest technique. And the incisions are even more accurate. It's robotic, so it's, it's much better. It's safer for the eye. And although the lenses are the same, the technique or the art of cataract surgery is in a different level of science altogether. Any more questions regarding the same? No, no, perfect. I mean, uh, you're going fine. We're listening to this cataract. I thought right. there was more to say about it. Now, uh, cataract has a few questions which, uh, which are lined up. Yes. Uh, general symptoms of developing a cataract. I mean, yes. how, do, how do I know that I have a cataract? In between, yes. I would like to share something. I have an issue in my right eye. I mean, I have an issue. I have to come back to you immediately as it opens or if I can come back to you tomorrow. I may require a cataract operation or something for my right eye because my vision is so bad that I have to wear uh, something like this when I'm sitting in front of a computer. But that's why I'm wearing glares all the time. Okay, now the question here is, uh, uh, what are the general symptoms that one should know that he has cataract? And secondly, how long can he wait for this maturity, I mean, what is the waiting period? Okay. I mean, should he immediately go or should he wait for sure. The general symptoms of cataract are a wide variety of symptoms. The simple thing is that I'm not seeing as well as I did. I have to keep changing my spectacles. I changed my spectacles three months ago 
and they're not working now. Number four, halos and glare, especially glare around lights. It could be room lights. It could be car headlights. Sensitive to light, especially if you have a type of cataract called a posterior subcapsular cataract or a posterior polar cataract, wherein it's on the, out, the innermost layer. So in bright light, when your pupil comes down, what happens, the rays of light tend to get concentrated and goes through that cataractous area. So your vision decreases in bright sunlight. Whereas there are certain cataracts which has, which is a nucleus sclerotic cataract, usually typically in the elderly patient where they say, I need more light to see better. So contrasting symptoms. A younger patient with a posterior subcapsular cataract can say, God, that light bothers me. My vision is so much better indoors. Whereas a person, an elderly 70, 75 year old says, newspapers are so much better when I sit in the bright sunlight and I read in the bright sunlight. So they need extra light. So there's a wide variety of, of visual symptoms regarding cataract. If you have cataracts in both eyes, often the patients grumble less. If you have a cataract in the one eye, the patient grumbles more. You've got good vision in one eye, like yourself. Yeah. And you've got bad vision in one eye. So automatically you are doing this, especially even after cataract surgery. You've had good cataract surgery. You can see well, but you've got a cataract in the other eye. So, oh my God, but both together, you're not getting the normal, comfortable binocular vision. So patients often present earlier if they have a unilateral cataract. And as to how early you can present, Believe it or not, there are patients who present to me as early as a stage when I say, right, come back in six months. You've got an early cataract. I think you can wait. Because let me tell you, although I do operate on patients who can read the last line, it's a calculated risk when you're giving an operation to a person who's already reading the last line. It is the patient's choice, not the doctor's choice. The patient has to be informed, you're already reading the last line, but there's a certain quality that is missing. So you really have to be able to appreciate that 5% dif that difference in quality when you're already reading the last line in a Slenin chart in a doctor's chamber, and yet you're asking for cataract surgery. I will give it because the latest cataract surgery techniques, the latest lenses can give you a difference in that 5% of vision. But it is also that 0.1% risk factor wherein the patient does not get that visual quality he wants. So I always give the patient the option, come back in six months, see whether these new glasses are making a difference. Wait until there's a one line drop. Again, there are patients who are not complaining, although they are just seeing the first two lines because they are complacent. They don't have an active lifestyle. They are not working. All they're doing is sitting Either they're playing games on their iPad, sitting on a wheelchair, or they, they are, they, they've got bilateral cataracts and they are happy. So you've got to realize that you need a cataract, you need an assessment of cataract. Often leave it to the doctor, trust your doctor. When the doctor says, wait, then perhaps wait. If the doctor says, go in for surgery, go in for surgery. If you know the doctor and if you trust the doctor. Again, if the doctor says, You've got advanced cataracts. What have you been doing? Sometimes it is like the family circumstances. They live alone, their parents, their children don't live here. They would have wanted to get cataract surgery done earlier and they couldn't or they haven't. So often give the benefit of doubt. Often the patients say, ye pak jayega, fir hum karenge. And I often laugh at them and, and say, listen, it's not a mango which is going to become ripe, ripe like a, an Alfonso or a Heem Sagar and then you're going to eat it. You do the cataract when you are having visual problems and you don't want it to ripen. You don't want a ripe, mature cataract because technically it becomes much more difficult. And even somebody like me who has 30 years of experience of cataract surgery, I, I, you know, I enjoy and yet I don't enjoy doing mature, ripe, hard cataracts because the visual rehabilitation of that patient is so much more time consuming. Okay, what are the risks of cataracts? After cataract, what are the precautions one has to take for life? 
or is it like a normal life that we normal life we lead or the eyes remain the normal or what i we want to understand the precaution the precaution one has to take for life life yeah that avoid a blunt injury okay uh, if a normal person uh, you know gets slapped you can perhaps withstand it or gets thumped you can perhaps withstand it a person after even after a year after cataract surgery you get thumped in the eye you're asking for trouble maybe that lens can shift you can get trauma you can get bleed so what happens then if in case it happens what is the case it happens you've got to wait for the blood to uh, uh, you know uh, dissipate and you've got to find out whether that lens needs repositioning or not in a worst case scenario now so the blindness sorry it is not complete blindness i mean the option uh, very r- rarely it can lead to blindness but that's very rare number two swimming i tell my patients you can swim after two months you can't swim for two months very uh, uh, you know when when they are very adamant i say you can swim in the sea in a in about six months time you can uh, enough they often want to go to harkipori and haridwar and rishikesh in a flowing ganga you can perhaps with a lot of precaution after a year you can go up to here squeeze your eyes really tightly shut say your prayers and perhaps do a little dubki and immediately dry up your eyes maybe after a year that too you're taking a little bit of a risk but in a normal swimming pool after about 2 or 3 months you can swim you could certainly do a breast stroke with your goggles on now the this is an, in in the post op period but in the immediate post operative period you've got to be very careful you've got to uh, get the drops put in the first two weeks you've got to have somebody put the drops in for you you shouldn't try and put the drops in you know because you can poke yourself in the eye you know uh, you you may not be able to put the drop right into the eye there has to be a time between the drops you shouldn't put the drops in yourself and you've got to keep the eyes very very clean you know the eyelid margins get caked with oily secretions with the residues of the drops patients often come with very good vision and nice you know comfortable eyes but their eyelids are nice and caked and dirty and oily so that has to be cleaned you've got to have a bath from day 1 from here downwards when can i have a bath from day 1 you have a bath from here downwards i tell the patient how you bathe is your business make sure soap dirty water sweaty water does not get into the eye immediately for the first 4 5 days have a bath from here downwards take a towel and you know have a bath from there you know stand under a shower after about you know 5 or 6 uh, days you can have a bath put the drops in regularly and if ever there is pain redness inflammation decreased vision immediately present to the doctor if you cannot get hold of the doctor you present to your local doctor you present to a general ophthalmologist you present to a a hospital with an emergency don't sit at home the doctor who has operated on you should be available will be available but may not be available due to circumstances that does not mean that you will sit at home and do nothing you get help how you get help is your business send a message find out where the doctor is if the doctor is traveling find out his recommendation if you cannot get a recommendation i'm sure there's a doctor but don't sit on the problem okay. and follow the instructions taper off the drops as required use lubricating drops for foreign body sensations make sure that you don't get dhulo bali rod kham dhakka dhula nahi lagna chahiye dhakka nahi lagna chahiye sunlight nahi lagna chahiye okay you think you want to say anything more about on the subject called cataract because uh, perhaps this is one of your best uh, fields anybody who wants to you think you should know about it uh you can ask me any questions i mean uh there are it's such a vast subject that uh, okay you know, the next question that we have on cataract is when is it too late to go for a cataract and what is this hard lens sometimes yes patient of food never, it's never too late my oldest patient was 101 he was actually a sanyasi who who looked about uh, 90 it's never too late to go for cataract surgery even if you have the one year of life left in you you will have that one year of life wherein you will see your great grandchildren you will see your grandchildren you will see the television better so it doesn't matter that oh my god i'm so old how can i have surgery 
So it's ne you're never too old if there is no co major comorbidity. If your general physician will allow it, you go in for cataract surgery. A hard cataract, a very, very hard cataract may not be suitable for FACO or PEM2, wherein you've got to go in for the traditional cataract surgery. You don't want to uh, compromise the internal structure by trying to prove a point that you're the world's best cataract surgeon or PEM2 surgeon. Sometimes you swallow your pride and you just open up the eye and remove the cataract and very safely put in that long, that slightly bigger rigid lens. So yes, there are many ways to skin a cat. How you will skin the cat, leave it to the surgeon's discretion. The proof of the pudding lies in the eating. In a fake or a femto, you will taste your pudding within, uh, within uh, a day. And in a hard cataract, which you've left for too long, you might need stitches, which might need removal. You might need visual rehabilitation with your spectacles, which might need to be changed. But yes, ultimately you will see, but it'll take so much longer. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Uh, uh, Preeti ji, are you there? Preeti ji, are you there? You had a question to ask. Uh, is Preeti ji there? Okay. There are people who have raised hands here. And in the meantime, uh, Kavita ji, you have some questions which are lined yeah, up. Yeah, there are, there are a few questions. Please ask. Ubri has been prescribed by my doctor. So can you please tell the reason for the same? Can you please, uh, pardon me? Ubri. Uh, we, we can't hear Ubri has been prescribed by the doctor, so can you please tell the reason for the same? Ubri is usually yeah. prescribed for dry eyes. So it's basically, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, it's a preservative free or a very low preservative. There is a it for dry eye disease, foreign to... body sensation. Okay, okay next okay, question is from one... Manita. Okay, I'm sorry, sorry, Kavita ji, please continue. Yeah, what is reverse cataract and which may be required decade after the cataract surgery? Once more, please. What is a reverse cataract? Reverse cataract or reverse cataract. Are you sure it's a reverse cataract? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually written. I have a... I'd like to pass this question, question, please. Whose question is this? What is a reverse cataract? Okay, let's go to the next question. Uh, Vanita Bajoria ji, are you there? Vanita Bajoria ji, please ask a question. 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 Yes, I am here. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, please ask. One particular is there are phones working together. There are very good. There are two people using the phone in the same room. Happening, there's an echo happening. Hello? Okay, yeah, please continue. Bonita ji, you want to ask a question? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Please continue. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, doctor. Good afternoon. Uh, like my husband has uh, got a detachment operation done. Okay. So, uh, I am suppo I was supposed to go for a setup after six months uh, to Chennai, but because of this lockdown, I am I was unable to go. So, is there any precaution that I should take? Um, I'm sure the doctor Chankar Mitrale will be able to guide you. You've got to be uh, in touch with him on email as to how to reduce the drops. If there's any, you know, in retinal detachment surgery, sometimes you have to sleep in a particular position if there's an oil in the eye. They would best be able to tell you uh, what precautions to do. But basically, very important is that uh, uh, if, in case there's a hemorrhage in the eye as well, you need to sleep propped up uh, to continue with the drops. Be aware that your vision should be slowly improving. If there's any deterioration of vision or anything like that, uh, there's always a very remote chance of the retina getting re-detached. So be in touch with the surgeon who has operated on you. I think that is very important. And I'm quite sure there are certain hospitals uh, like um, uh, Tisha, Susruta, or uh, Priyamvada Bridla, and Chankar Nitrale here in Calcutta who can help you out if there's an emergency for the retina. There are good centers there. Okay, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. The next question is from Shashi Modi ji. Are you there? Oh, good afternoon, Doctor. Good afternoon. Uh, my husband is vision 6.9, 6 9.6. 6. 
जंगल मेडिसिन Uh, how old is he? Fifty-four. See, there is no such thing as uh, what is the best vitamin medicine. Yeah, uh, he's got six by nine. He could probably have one extra line of vision. Uh, mm-hmm. Find out whether he's got an early cataract. If there's any reason to have by six by nine. Uh, if there's no cataract, find out whether he's got high power or whether he's got uh, any retinal pathology or anything like that. But I have a normal broad spectrum multivitamin. If there is a retinal problem, you can have antioxidants. Your doctor will be able to tell you what is good. But the simple thing which I tell my patients is "hara dekhiye, hara kaiye." Ha! Huh. But any multivitamin like like what? Ah, uh, you see, I don't think on this platform I should be advising you on a multivitamin. I take a couple of multivitamins a day. I mean, you know, an occasional vitamin C, an occasional sort of broad spectrum multivitamin. But if there's no particular reason. just have a broad spectrum multivitamin speak to your gp about that i should not be uh, giving you the names of multivitamins on local i platform. think uh, we we should not get into med- medicine questions no prescriptions please uh, doctor how much how much more time you have with us 5 10 minutes uh, uh, i have exactly 5 more minutes papa ji 5 more minutes so let's just sum it up now uh, kavita ji have you, have you missed out any question yeah there are few questions make it very fast i mean try to make them very short and precise yeah please go on yeah so there please is this on. retina detachment hereditary how can one avoid it retinal detachment is usually not hereditary it's usually not i mean uh, hereditary although um if you have high minus power which runs in the family Uh, that is always uh, uh, one of the uh, reasons uh, where you can get retinal detachment. Your father had high power, you've got high power. But if there's a family history of uh, retinal detachment, we always take that very seriously. That is one of the points we look out for. But it's not that you know if it's not like say you know like a retinitis pigmentosa situation or where wherein if if some parent has it, there's a very high chance that you're going to have it. But If a parent or a grandparent has had retinal detachment, we will take that into consideration. If the patient has floaters or flashes, say, and if the patient says, "I've got floaters and flashes over three days, and my father had a retinal detachment," we will obviously take an extra five minutes to examine that person's retina more carefully because, yes, there is a chance that it's possibility. Yes. Okay. Next okay. question. Next Kavita. question. Can onset of cancer be known through eye examination? onset of cancer be known through an eye examination well the cancer would have to be it's it is it is possible wherein you can get a a secondary where you can actually dilate the pupil and have a look at a suspicious lesion on the retina but that's a uh, chances one in a thousand probably 30 years of private practice i've come across one such case where i've dilated the pupil and i've seen something and that turned out to be the secondary from a liver so that's very rare i mean uh, uh, and cancer in the eye is also very rare with a as a primary cancer wherein you can get a primary cancerous tumor in the eye but cancer anywhere else in the body if it's presenting in the eye it is almost usually a secondary but as i've said i've seen probably one or two patients that too working as a junior consultant in a general hospital where you get so many cancer referrals so it's very rare okay. next question kavita ji make it fast there's far. one more question from someone my father's cataract surgery failed he was a diabetic and had inflammation in his retina doctor had suggested some injections but said there is no guarantee also advised not to get the second eye operated for cataract in future getting the second eye operated for cataract in the future future after you've had a complicated first eye number 1 uh, is a choice of the patient a choice of the doctor you can always take a second opinion if the first doctor 
under whom the complication probably took place, you know, is reluctant to operate on your second eye, always take a second opinion. I mean, we've, we've operated on patients for the second eye where they've even got a plastic eye where the first eye has failed. So vision is such a thing that you will be compelled to take a chance on your second eye. You will have to go in for a second eye operation and try and overcome the problems which happened in the first eye, probably, you know, uncontrolled diabetes or whatever, take extra precaution regarding the retina, the retinal, uh, you know, infection or high diabetes or whatever. And if injections are being recommended for the first time, definitely go by, see the best retinal uh, you know, surgeon in Calcutta. We have many retinal uh, surgeons in Calcutta, both at Fortis and uh, elsewhere. You can always take a second and a third opinion, but whether you choose to have your second eye operation or not is a choice which you have to take. It is your bridge to cross. And then you just take a second or a third opinion and take the best doctor who you are comfortable with. Okay, there's one more question. We have only two more minutes because she gave me five minutes and all. Yes. So please ask your last question. Okay. Is it okay to use refreshed tears if you have continuous irritation or you have cylindrical pain? It is Again, okay to question. use refreshed tears whether or not you've got cylindrical pain. It is not the remedy of choice for cylindrical pain. It can be a symptom that you have cylindrical pa, you're not wearing your cylindrical pa, so you've got congestion, you've got tiredness, you've got eye aches, and so you want to use refreshed tears. That cannot be a remedy for cylindrical pa. You can use it for any kind of pa, refreshed tears. If irritation continues with refreshed tears, it is not okay to use refreshed tears. In the wide variety of drops in the armamentarium of treatment available in dry eyes, if there's one to 10, then refreshed tears or carboxymethyl cellulose is level one to two. So there are at least seven to eight categories of drops which are available, which can be used if refreshed tears and carboxymethyl cellulose fails. So if you're getting continuous irritation, no, just refreshed tears may not do. You've got to find out how bad your dry eyes is, why you're getting dry eyes, whether you've got a rheumatological problem, whether you're pill popping various other medications, which is causing dry eyes. You, as I've said, you know, dry eyes is a, is a, a one-hour lecture in itself. So, if you've got continuous irritation, visit your ophthalmologist. Get a, a slip lamp examination. Get a Shermer's test. Take your list of medicines from your GP. Make sure that there's a tick for everything. Find out when your irritation is getting worse in the morning or in the evening. If it's in the morning, it's probably your lid margin disease because you've slept with your eyes closed the whole night and so things, irritation has built up. If your irritation is worse at the end of the day after seeing the computer for 10 hours, it's almost certainly related to dry eyes associated with visual screen. So find out, do a little questionnaire yourself so that you have the right questions for the doctor. Okay, let's all sum it up now. It's been a wonderful session, doctor. And I have one request to make because we have so many unanswered questions. If we invite you again for another session, would you be interested in joining? If the patients can tolerate me, then why not? Oh, no, no, you have been a wonderful. Your session has been really, really good. And you have lasted, I mean, you've been staying here for almost one hour and 55 minutes. Yeah. That's been a record for us because so far, ma'am, session we've ma had. One of our audience, Anil Sarma, lovely yes. way of explaining doctor, reminds me of school days sitting in a classroom and listening. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anilji. Thank so you. You're already invited once again. It has been Thank a you, great, great you. honor to have you on board. One last it, it, You have it, taught it, us one best remedy today, 2020. We want to ask you one last question as to how, when we are adding drops to our eyes, you have a very beautiful way of describing how to add eye drops into the eyes. Can you please show it all to us? Uh, see, I sometimes occasionally use a refresh tear, so I tilt my hair back, head back, okay? Now I've got, God willing, good vision in both eyes. If you've got poor vision in one eye, it becomes difficult. So this is something, you bring your, I rest my fingers, I open up the lower eyelid, I, you know, restrict one hand, look up. I tilt my head to one side so that that forms a little cul-de-sac and I put the drop in there and I feel the drop as it goes into the inside edge and then I tilt my head and I blink a few times and close my eyes. That's the way I do it. 
okay, this is what it's a learning because normally what we do is we pick up the drop, finish, we are done. We don't even give it two seconds. We don't even yeah. wait for two seconds for it to settle down. So, guys, we had a fantastic session, and today's session was really a great knowledge for us. We we actually learned a lot today. Learned a lot of basics about eyes. So many things and so many diseases I didn't even know. Thank you so much for uh, for being here, doctor. And Thank we would like to have you again very soon. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and wishing you a great success with Papa JC. Thank you, you so have much. a great audience. Thank you so much, and thank you, Kavita, and thank you. Ravi, thank, thank you, you for the entire Thank you, Kavita. Thank, thank you, Ravi. Thank you, Eman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Thanks, my dear. Ravi, you can log off. Yeah. I'm so tired. <sighs> Go away.